PowerPoint workshop and for looking at the reading. But if you had already done that, you can kind of just hang out uh, and watch and then you'll have the work done if you did it early, uh, which I looked at who had it done and very few people had it done. So that's OK. You have time today to do that. So uh, our project is looking at how um, information technology has changed society. And we're looking at today how information technology uh, is impacting your age group, teenagers, um, as well as society. But our first task and some of our need to knows was part of how did the printing press impact and change the world? Now, we, we can assume and we know and infer that it provided more you know, books, provided more printing, provided more information to the world. But what changes did that cause? And to understand the changes, we need to first look at the medieval Europe and kind of what happened right before the creation of the printing press, which was the bubonic plague uh, or the Black Death. So we're going to do a little workshop on that, and then we're going to look at how the Black Death kind of played a role in changing history as well, along with information technology So uh, in the printing press. So we're going to look at this PowerPoint, and then we're going to do a short reading and we'll read that together, um, and then you all have a short assignment, and then you are done for the week for this class. So if you click on this link, it'll take you to an Echo link, but essentially it'll end up being here, um, and you can pull that up on your computer, or you can just watch through the Google Meet if you'd like. Uh, you should take notes on this, and this is fair game for uh, an exam um, at the end of the project or toward the end of the project. Um, and uh, I'll show you kind of the big ideas of what you need to take away here. Um, so I'm letting you all open that up. Give me just a second. I'm going to turn on Go Guardian. And if you have questions, you can ask me through Go Guardian because I'm going to be on this PowerPoint. So if you need me to stop, obviously you can interrupt through the Google Meet and say, hey, Mr. Richard, I have a question um, or a comment. Uh, or you can go through Go Guardian. So I'm bringing up Go Guardian right now. Finish that. Sorry, I didn't hear whatever someone just said. What if you finished it? The PowerPoint and the reading. Yeah. Yeah. So if you finish the PowerPoint and the reading, um, then you are good just to kind of hang out and observe. Um, you can kind of work on other things. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just hang out and uh, you'll be good to go. So um, just in case there's something you missed or you have questions on. Okay. All right. So looking over this, um, and I'm going to go ahead right now and send out before we move on. Go over to the Google Meet. Here's the link for attendance. So if you want to fill that out really quick while I'm bringing everything else up, you can fill out. So click that link that's in the Google Meet, uh, Google Chat, and obviously whatever grade uh, over looking at this. So <clears throat> the medi medieval period, uh, also known as the Dark Ages, uh, were from f about, it's a rough estimate here, about from 500 to 1400. Some people say it started in 400 and only went to 1300, and it's flexible. But it was almost a thousand years um, in which um, there was kind of very few advancements in Europe um, and very few changes um, through technology and government and religion and all these uh, cultural and societal ideas, very few things changed. Um, and this would come with the end. Uh, one of the things that would help to end the medieval period was the bubonic plague. Um, and then what would come out of that would be um, the printing press, the Renaissance, scientific revolution, and like all these big changes. And this is kind of our starting point. So the beginning of the medieval period came around 476 AD, which was the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, at least the western portion of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine uh, Empire, um, which was the Eastern Orthodox uh, portion would technically not fall for another thousand years, but essentially the structure that was the Roman Empire would fall. And we've looked at the Roman Empire before, surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea, 
and the collapse of the Roman Empire would collapse a lot of stability that was in uh, Europe. Okay, and we're going to find out kind of uh, what happens with the fall of the Roman Empire. So what would change in the West, uh, in Western Europe? Uh, the first would be that there was repeated invasions and constant warfare at the end of the Roman Empire. To simplify it, um, basically the Roman Empire would be broken up into many, many, many uh, small kind of um, uh, principalities or small um, kind of uh, countries of their own, okay, um, in which – so this giant empire was, is kind of taken apart, and it would be constant warfare. This would disrupt trade, okay? So the big idea here is disrupt trade. Um, merchants faced invasion from land and sea. Business collapsed. Money became scarce. So essentially, this structure that was there in the Roman Empire, um, this disruption of trade would make it much harder on the people, okay? Because they, it was harder to get... Uh, goods for survival, okay? Especially within larger cities, okay? And this would cause the downfall of these cities because um, when you're in a large city, there isn't um, access to all of these like grain and farming equipment and all these things that you need to survive and water um, and all these things that you need to survive. So people would begin to leave cities and go out into the rural areas, um, and there would be this population shift, okay? People would move from cities to the countryside, and Europe became much more rural, okay, which means living in the countryside, not living in large cities, okay? So with the fall of the Roman Empire, people are shifting away from cities and out into um, basically the fields, um, and into the rural area to be able to farm and support themselves and survive because this trade would fall. Okay, so that's one big thing that would happen during the medieval period is that there would be a disruption in trade. There would be a downfall of cities. Cities were abandoned and people would move to the countryside or to rural areas. Um, and you can imagine that as you move away and people become areas become less and less populated, there's less opportunity for education. There's less opportunity uh, for changes and advancements um, because people are divided. And as people are together and communicating, uh, there's less communicating and less opportunity to build and, and uh, to, to make changes and learn. Um, you know, we're really simplifying this, but essentially this would kind of be part of the reason these dark ages, as they're called, or medieval period would occur. So people would then turn to the church for order and security. So one of the last, so when the government of the Roman Empire fell, the Catholic Church still stayed together and still had power. Okay, um, so people would actually turn to, away from the government and kind of the church would take um, more power and have more security, which is actually really good for the people because without the church, millions probably would have died um, from starvation and from chaos and war and things like that. But the church actually provided some order and security. Um, German Germanic people called Franks were led by Clovis and converted to Christianity. Uh, churches adapted the rural conditions of Western Europe to uh, build communities called monasteries. So this, the churches would spread out. And the big idea is that people were turning to the church for security. You don't have to memorize the fact that Germanic people called Franks were turned to Christianity. But these big giant swaths of land and groups were broken into these monasteries in which people would go to the church as kind of for um, guidance and and kind of for organization within um, Europe at this time. So a lot of turn to the to religion and a lot of turn to um, religious beliefs. Uh, so less on um, secular ideas. And on your Kim chart, you should have seen um, one of the words was secular. Um, and secular basically means anything outside of the church. 
Okay. Um, so secular can be, you know, education and science outside of the church. Uh, secular can, um, secularism, basically any ideas outside of the church. So the church becomes this real focal point for people. Okay. I have to grab my daughter and make sure she's in class. I'll be right back. All right. So, um, so people are turning to the church, okay? And there's less secular secular thought. There's less thoughts outside of the church, and they're depending on the church more. So the government would shift to a feudal system, okay? Um, and you should have heard about feudal systems in middle school, but we'll cover those really quickly. The feudal system provided order and stability. Everyone knew their place, okay? Because the feudal system was this very... Um, strict hierarchical system in which people lived and served within the ranks that they were. And it was very difficult to move up and down in those ranks. Okay. The manor manorial system provided for an economy that was based on farming and being self-sufficient on the manor. So these people, most people would live on a manor that was um, run by a lord or vassal. Um, that would kind of have power over these people and they would provide pr protection and land while um, the serfs or the lower groups would provide labor, okay, um, and food because they would do the farming, okay. Um, and this was a monarchy, okay, it was a, kind of an autocracy in which there was a monarchy, where one person had the power and others had to follow their lead and uh, didn't get a lot of choice in their in their lives. Okay, so this is what the feudal system looks like: a triangle with uh, one person in the top in power, and that would be a king, and then it stepped down to lords, lesser lords or vassals, knights, and then peasants or serfs. Peasants would live almost like slaves, okay, because they uh, didn't own anything, and basically their only lot in life was to um, provide labor, okay? Um, they weren't necessarily the property of the lords or the kings or the knights, but they were essentially just servants, okay, and, and, and workers and laborers. Um, as you go up the uh, – this – would or the lower levels would provide for other levels, and what they would provide is military service. So, like knights and lesser lords would provide military service. They would provide labor, like peasants would work for the lords, uh, and they would just be loyal to these different groups. So, the king at the head would have all the loyalty and receive labor and military service from the people below them. And as you move down, they would provide, so the kings and the lords owned all of the land and provided protection uh, to the knights and the peasants and things like that. So this system uh, in a time of chaos worked very well uh, because it provided security. But as you can see, it provided very little for people to move or to learn or to advance or to change their life, okay, because a majority of the population were serfs and peasants, and they had very little opportunity to change their lives. Knights even uh, would be given very little opportunity for education other than military education. And the lords and the king and the these vassals were the only group that really were given much opportunity for education. So let's look at education. So during the Middle Ages, only 5%, 5% of the population could read or write, which today it's the opposite. Okay, today um, you know ninety-five percent or more of the population can read and write. Usually, only rich sons would have an opportunity to attend school. So, serfs did not go to school. Serfs did not have an opportunity to learn to read to to acquire information, um, and the opportunities are very limited. Excuse me. The Catholic Church controlled a majority of the education, and the education only concentrated on teaching Latin, okay, which was not the language of the people, okay? Italians spoke, or it, uh, people from Italy spoke Italian, people from France spoke French, Germans spoke German, um, and they didn't speak Latin. That was the educated class uh, knew how to read, speak, and write in Latin. 
In 1391, a petition was sent to King Richard II of England to bar presents, peasants from attending school. So in the late 1300s, toward the end of the medieval period, this is very important, that a petition was sent to King Richard to, of England to keep peasants from attending school. So you can see that around the end of the 1300s, there's a change to where peasants are trying to go to school and the government is holding them back. We're going to look at why that's significant because, um, you know, they want to control them. So they don't want to give them power. They don't want to give them the ability to do this. So let's look at the church and the Holy Roman Empire. So just looking at this crown, um, someone pop in. What do you think of this crown? Like, I want to hear from you all. Someone, someone say something. What do you think of this crown? It's got a lot of gems on it. Yeah, it has a lot of gems, okay? What is it made of? Made of gold, and it has a cross on it. Yeah, so this is def it has a cross, so it, it's definitely representing the church. And it looks like, do you think this is a very cheap artifact, or do you think this was a very valuable artifact? Definitely valuable. Yeah, this was a very ornate, very special, very valuable, very expensive um um, crown. Okay. So the Holy Roman empire during this time, because people are turning to the church, uh, and the church is growing in power, they're going to become very, very wealthy. Okay. Feudalism and manner system created division among people, shared beliefs and teaching and the church bonded them together. So the church brought people together and allowed for security. Um, and then priests and religious officials administered sacraments, uh, and they kind of took on that power and even kings all the way from kings to peasants were subject to what's called canon law. OK, these are laws of the church um, in matters of marriage and religious practice. So the church is growing very, very powerful. And this is going to we're going to see this big change later in the Reformation, which is going to be the split of the Catholic Church from just the, the Christianity from just the Catholic Church to Catholic and Protestant in Western Europe. Okay, so we see the church is growing very powerful. And that's the big takeaway from this. They're growing very powerful and wealthy during the medieval period. All right, so along comes the bubonic plague in 1346, um, and it's going to hit Europe. Uh, the bubonic plague had been around for a while, um, and it will come from Asia into Europe. Um, but let's take a look at what is going on with this. It's also known as the Black Death, um, and this is uh, the disease that devastated from 1347 to the early 1350s, so around 8 to 10 years. Um, the Black Death would kill over 20 million people in Europe, so a third of the population, okay? And again, many people would turn to the Catholic Church for help, believing that the Black Death was God's wrath, okay? So we see towards the end, and we know that the um, end of the medieval period is marked around the mid-1300s to late 1400s. So the Black Death would actually end this medieval period in this time of separation, in this time of kind of... Um, kind of dark ages. And it's interesting that it would come with the, a plague, okay? Killing a third of the population um, and people diving even deeper into the into church and religion, um, which isn't necessarily a negative. It's just that, you know, they're going away from secular education and sciences and things like that, um, going into religion. Um, and the big thing is a lot of people didn't understand what was going on with the Black Death, uh, with the bubonic plague, and they blamed uh, they thought that it was God's wrath um, and that it was actually God um, tormenting them and, and punishing them uh, for uh, evil deeds. So the spread of Black Death, this is kind of the, a look um, of what kind of the spread. And you can see where the Roman Empire was around the Mediterranean Sea. We see that it travels in from Asia through the Black Sea. Um, and up, and the first place that we really see it is Genoa, uh, Italy, uh, and then it begins to spread around. And you can see, and again, we go back to our themes of geography and movement. 
um, the Mediterranean Sea is a, a real spreader of the bubonic plague because it would go on ships. Um, and, and I'm sure some of you all have heard about the bubonic plague, but what did it spread? What helped to spread the bubonic uh, plague? Who can help me out here? Is it animals? Yeah, animals. Anyone know specifically what animal carried it? Fleas and rats. Fleas and rats. Good. So fleas and rats uh, would get on ships, and those ships would go around. Um, and as they uh, landed and tied off, these rats would crawl off the ships through the ropes and things like that. And then those cities would become uh, – the fleas would bite the rats, and then the fleas would jump on humans and bite the humans and, and would spread throughout Europe. So let's talk about the negative – and I'll move my face over here. Let's talk about the negative and positive impacts of – the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Um, so yes, there are there obviously terrible negatives, but there are also positives that will come out of this um, because it will pull um, Europe out of um, out of uh, the medieval period. So negative results: significant decrease in decrease in population. Okay, and you'll need this information later on the next assignment on this second assignment for today. So make sure you're paying attention to this. The exact number of deaths is hard to know, about 20 million, uh, and that's in about five years of when it would, was really peaked. Um, obviously, it's, it's hard to know because it was so long ago and the records, you know, there's poor records, but anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the population. Um, and we know that the population of Paris was cut in half over 100 years, and the, the bubonic pl uh, plague is definitely part of that. And... To give me an understanding of what 20 million would look like, uh, looking at the United States, it's like these 12 states, okay? Um, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, all these states. Um, it's like all the people in those 12 states dying. So it was a huge number. Um, and obviously this is um, hearkening on to what we're living in right now with um, the coronavirus. Obviously a very different uh, illness, um, and we're, we're not seeing 20 million, um, even worldwide, uh, dying, but we are seeing many, uh, so you can kind of see the likeness here. Um, but one negative result was death, okay, a large amount of death. The second negative result of the bubonic plague was economic disruption, okay? Um, economic disruption from 1347 to 52, Europe experienced major economic disruption. The big thing was people are dying, so there's less people to work, okay? Guilds lost guilds craftsmen, towns weren't able to have blacksmiths or mill workers and specialized jobs. Um, also, there was an oversupply of goods. There were less people to buy the goods that had already been created. Um, so there's less people eating and less people needing tools and less people needing uh, certain things, okay? And then people kind of not getting paid because people aren't buying things. Um, feudal lords aren't able to be able to pay their debts. Okay, um, and so this the feudal system starts breaking down because the serfs um, aren't able to sell off their goods to you know people, and, and knights and vassals aren't able to pay off the higher lords, and and this system starts falling. And in, in the very beginning, this is really detrimental to Europe because you see a lot of uh, people not having money and not uh, being able to support one another, uh, people not being able to work and create. Um, so this is this economic disruption uh, begins uh, to really be a negative uh, for Europe. We're going to see this turn around later and be a positive, um, which is kind of strange. Uh, but at first, because of the shortage of workers um, and the oversupply of goods, and people not being able to make money uh, made it very, very negative. All right. The next one was religious disruption. Um, many leaders of the church would die because they would go out into um, the community and seek out these people that were dying, and they would get sick themselves um, because of the bubonic plague and how, how it infected people. Um, they would die themselves. Um, 
the church would grow very wealthy as people gave money to the church to get help. So these very wealthy people, these vassals and lords and kings would, you know, pay great amount of money to the church, hoping because they believed it was God's wrath, thinking the church would help, but the church would fail them because um, of how the bubonic plague, um, you know, it didn't matter how much money you gave to the church at this time, um, you would die. Um, so people would believe um, that, you know, the church was failing them, um, that maybe the church was not able to help like they said they could. Um, also, people were blaming um, Jews, and there's evidence of uh, many, um, you know, primary sources in which uh, the Jewish people of the world uh, were being blamed uh, for poisoning Christians, you know, and there's no truth or validity to this, but many Jews were killed in, by panic mobs and, and kind of uh, threatened and um, really, you know, could have been endangered because of this. So really just religious disruption. Uh, the big ideas here are religious disruption and then leaders would die um, and people began to have less faith in the church and many Jewish people were blamed. So those are the big ideas to take from uh, this slide. So let's shift over and look at some positive impacts. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously it's not really a positive to say that many died, but at the after the plague, um, this is kind of what would be the uh, result. So there was an increase in the value of manpower. Because there was less people to work, each person that lived and survived, they, become more, they became more valuable because they needed people to continue to work. So the drop in population would result in people became more rare, a more rare commodity. So those serfs that were laboring, you know, became more rare and there was an increase in wages. So people began to need people to work. So they're willing to pay them more. So in England, during the 1350s, wages doubled, okay? And the end of serf serfdom, that, that lowest class, began to break apart and would begin to end in the West, in, the, in Europe, because people needed workers and they were willing to pay them because there were so few people willing or able to work. So many people had died. So this was a huge positive that serfs began, uh, began to be paid more um, and began to be able to uh, get so much more out of their work. Another positive is a growth in industry. Okay, As a traditional medieval manorial system where people lived on farms and the lords owned over them and the kings over them, as that began to break down, people began to move back to cities, okay, and communities in um, larger communities in the countryside. This led to re-urbanization of Europe, and the industry and uh, lifestyle of Europeans began to become more modern, okay? So people started, because the failing uh, system and the feudal system out in the rural areas began to fail, people needed work, so they were moving back into the cities, finding places to work, finding uh, growing industry, being paid more, um, and that system began to fail in, um, in the medieval period of Europe. Lastly, um, another positive impact was the birth of modern medicine. Um, the church began uh, to allow dissections of bodies, um, allowing more people uh, to kind of look at why the bubonic plague happened, um, a movement to end the humorous theory of medicine, which was like bloodletting and using leeches and the, these ideas that, um, you know, the biological um, understanding of a human is directly linked um, to kind of this idea of religion um, and that, you um, bloodletting and things like that would lead to health um, and kind of getting ridding the body of like demons and negative spirits and things like that. This humorous theory uh, would move away from that and they would look at more of a scientific medical look uh, because they were trying to understand 
what was going on with the bubonic plague. Uh, be- people began to see the need for better hygiene and the connection between the spread of the Black Death. So as um, you know, people understood that there was a need for cleaning and hygiene, and this wasn't an overnight change, but people started to note and move toward these changes in medicine. Okay, so those are our positive to kind of re uh, go through those really quick. The first negative is population decrease. Second negative is economic disruption. Third negative is re- religious disruption. Our positives are uh, increase in manpower, uh, growth of industry, and the birth of modern medicine. So now if we go back to Echo and we look at the impacts of Black Death reading and notes assignment, it says open the template provided and read the document. Look for what happened as a result of the bubonic plague. Highlight the impacts of the bubonic plague and complete the graphic organizer at the bottom of the document. Okay, so I'm going to let you all go into that assignment. Open up the template, which is right here, and uh, go back to Echo and hit submit my work. And I'm going to let you all open that up. While you're opening that up, I will be... Hold on just a second. And we're going to read this together. Uh, Leonard, what type of fog is that? All right. So let's take a look at this, read through this together. So impact of the bubonic plague, black death. Uh, the plague ends population growth in Europe. So we're looking at the, for the impacts we're looking to highlight for those impacts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight and then make a note over here on the side and you all can do the same. But between 1347 and 1352, the Black Death killed more than 20 million people. So we can highlight this right here. And I'm just going to say negative. Ash killed millions. And so I'm making a little note here for that. This was one third of Europe's uh, or more of Europe's population. The plague began in Asia and spread to Europe on trading ships. At the time, no one knew what caused the plague. Many years later, the source was found to be bacteria from black rats and fleas. The fleas infected rats and the rats infected people after they hopped aboard ships and sailed to Genoa, Venice, Messina, and other European ports. From these cities, the plague spread quickly throughout Europe. So lethal was the disease that cases were known of persons going to bed well and dying before they woke. So rapidly did this spread from one to another uh, that to a French physician, it seemed as if one sick person could infect the world. So we see that the spread, a uh, huge negative that spread very quickly and that it killed millions. Rulers resist workers' demands for higher wages. So we talked about in the PowerPoint um, that higher wages were a positive, but one of the negatives is that rulers resisted workers' demands for higher wages. So let's read this. The plague had an important effect on the relationship between the lords who owned much of the land in Europe and the peasants who worked for the lords. As people died, it became harder and harder to find people to plow fields, harvest crops, and produce other goods and services. So this is one of our negatives. So we make note of that. So negative, less people to work. Peasants began to demand, demand higher wages. European rulers tried to keep wages from rising. In English law in 1349 tried to force workers to accept the same wages they received in 1346. A similar law in the statute of laborers was issued in 1351. The statute said that every healthy unemployment, unemployed person under 60 years old must work for anyone who wanted to hire him. 
workers who violated the statute of laborers were fined and were put in stocks as punishment for disobeying the statute. In 1360, punishment became worse. Workers who demanded higher wages could be sent to prison, and if they escaped, branded with a letter F, possibly for fugitive, on their foreheads. So we can see that in the beginning, early on, um, they were being forced to work, okay? Um, and we can put this as a negative. Um, negative in the In the beginning, people were forced to work. Okay. Greater scarcity of labor results in higher wage. So I want you. I'm going to let you all read these two on your own. Um, but this one essentially talks about uh, higher wages. So in the beginning, it was you know they weren't able to get higher wages, but in the end, they were able to get higher wages, and then act. How did agriculture change um, and how did it allow for people to move and create better uh, products? And then what I want you to do at the bottom is taking the slides that we had from the PowerPoint and what we've read in these paragraphs, and you all are finishing this, I already kind of have negatives. These are the positives. I want you to make a T-chart where you're kind of writing a sentence uh, and you should have at least, uh, let's, do, let's do three negatives and three positives okay and you can use the powerpoint or you can do this reading and make sure to submit this before the end of class okay